Imagine yourself transported back to Coney Island 1904. What would be on your list of things to do? Shoot the shoots? Check out the sideshow? Ride one of the world's first roller coasters? Or maybe bear witness to the deaths of thousands? Yes, in turn of the century Coney Island, disaster shows were big entertainment and people flocked to the cycloramas to enjoy them. Hold on. What's a cyclorama? Welcome back to Meet Me in Dreamland, where this season I am exploring the history of the attractions at the Dreamland Amusement Park, which was open from 1904 to 1911. Before we get going, it would be hugely helpful to me if you could drop a like down below, subscribe so you can see these videos as soon as they are available, and turn on the little bell too, because I guess that does something. So what is a cyclorama? And for the purposes of this video, I'm including a Mutarama, Kinetorama, Miriorama, Pyrodrama, and Panorama, but not Cinerama, Moldorama, Dollarama, or uh, Futurama. I hope that makes everything nice and clear for you. So, a cyclorama is basically a big picture. Thanks for joining me on today's episode. Basically, a big picture usually a painting, because, you know, 19th century and all that, that completely surrounds the viewer, giving them the impression that they are actually standing inside the scene. A sort of early virtual reality for Victorians. In 1787, an Irish artist named Robert Barker climbed Calton Hill near Edinburgh, Scotland, looked all around from the top, and thought, this view is pretty cool. I wish I could reproduce it. And he wound up making six large engravings of the view, set them up in a circle, and charged folks three shillings each to stand in the middle of them and, you know, look around. And holy crap, people thought that was the coolest thing they had ever seen. Thus, the cyclorama was born. But Barker didn't actually call it a cyclorama. He called it a panorama. <laughs> what an idiot! But no matter what it was called, it was popular. And Barker, seeing that he had a real opportunity to make some money, followed up the Calton Hill panorama with several more, including a view of London, Albion Mills, and Edinburgh itself, and designed a permanent building in Leicester Square just for exhibiting them. In order to augment the illusion, the canvases had their borders concealed, skylights allowed natural light to diffuse onto the paintings themselves, Imitators soon followed, leading to a panorama craze in Europe. Naturally, U.S. exhibitors began showing them in the middle of the 19th century, but realizing that Barker had made a terrible, terrible error, the panoramas were renamed cycloramas in the Americas. Cyclo meaning a circle, rama meaning view, instead of pana meaning all, rama meaning view. Thank God we got that sorted out. So, cycloramas toured all over the U.S., and any city worth anything had a purpose-built cyclorama building for folks to visit and, you know, stand in the middle of a big painting. But as the 19th century wore on, landscape cycloramas were becoming old hat. And with good cause, how many times could you go into a round building and pretend you were standing on a hill somewhere? So exhibitors began looking for new, more exciting subjects for their cycloramas, like battles. And since by this point it was the 1870s, the U.S. had recently had a bunch of battles in the form of the Civil War. Artists and exhibitors quickly leaped on the opportunity and replaced those musty old landscapes with scenes set in the middle of Gettysburg, Bull Run, the Battle of Atlanta, Shiloh. A lecturer would join the public viewers in the cyclorama and detail the history that they were looking at. Lighting tricks could even help the cyclorama crowds follow the story of the battle and the American public flocked to see them. Other battles were added to the roster, including Little Bighorn and various incidents during the Napoleonic Wars. Cycloramas became a major form of public entertainment and, well, propaganda as well. One of the most famous and still extant examples was the cyclorama depicting the Battle of Atlanta, where the Northern General Sherman defeated Confederate John Bell Hood and his army, a major turning point of the Civil War. However, after the cyclorama toured in the North, it was purchased by a Southerner who took it to Atlanta and had it altered to try and portray the battle as a Confederate victory. 
That cyclorama is still on display in Atlanta, by the way, and has since been returned to its original form. Because of the woke mob. So where do these fit into Coney Island's history? Well, as the 19th century gave way to the 20th, Coney Island had transformed from a seedy den of gambling and vice to a destination for family entertainment and a little less gambling and vice with the advent of the world's first amusement parks. And the same way that 1980s shopping malls weren't complete without a video game arcade, Coney Island's amusement parks had to have cycloramas. But just as the public had grown tired of landscapes decades before, they were now feeling bored with battles. Instead, Coney Island's cyclorama exhibitors hit upon the next big trend in their industry. Horrific disasters, preferably with body counts in the thousands. In 1902, one of the first of these new breed of cycloramas opened on Coney Island and portrayed the Johnstown Flood, a dam failure that had occurred in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1889 and washed away an entire town, killing 2,209 people. It was a big success. People loved it. The dam failure was a damn success. My 14-year-old wrote that joke. In 1904, another cyclorama followed Johnstown's success by portraying another horrific aquatic catastrophe, the Galveston Hurricane of 1900, only four years before, and the single deadliest natural disaster in United States history when a nightmarish storm struck the Texas island and killed between six and 12,000 people. Fun, take the kids. In order to portray the storm and flood in as realistic and dramatic a form as possible, the Galveston flood used lighting tricks, mechanical models, actual water, and steam to augment the cyclorama backdrop. Its designer, Edward J. Austin, referred to it as a mutorama, a changing view. And a 1904 article describes the experience of viewing it. The scene, as the spectator looks across the bay at the city, is one of continuous life and action. Waves scintillate and sparkle as they break on the white sand. Vessels and boats enter and leave the harbor. Trolley cars traverse the streets and trains cross the three-mile bridge spanning the bay that separates the city from the mainland. With new and beautiful cloud effects. Crimson clouds that form as the sun slowly sets over the ocean are gradually dissipated as the last rays light up church spires and tallest buildings. Shadows of buildings are seen, objects change their direction and lengthen with the setting sun. Darkness deepens. Lights appear one by one in buildings. The lighthouse throws its glare across the moving water. Trains, brilliantly illuminated, cross the bridge. The moonlight in the heavens marks its reflection across the waters of the gulf. Daylight returns after a realistic sunrise, the lecturer leading his audience up to the history of the storm. The wind howls across the gulf. Clouds gather in the sky. Darkness comes on with the approaching storm. Rain falls in torrents, lightning flashes and thunder roars, the water rises. One sees the waves increasing in size and fury as they dash on the strand, each succeeding wave encroaching farther on the shore until the beach and nearby streets are inundated. Louder shrieks the wind, fiercer the roar of the waters until everything is blocked out, in the storm mist. Only larger buildings on the more elevated parts of the island remain above the flood. The storm dies away. The rain ceases and the waters recede. Ruins of the once noble city. With the waters still washing in the streets is the scene now presented. Shattered houses, warehouses wrecked, Vessels driven high out of the water and lying in a weird tangle on the beach is all that is now left of the fleet lately in the docks. The ooze and scum of the ocean now covers everything. The light fades until it is all dark. Gradually, through the gloom, one sees slowly forming the outlines of a new picture, which presently stands revealed as Galveston as it will appear 
when the new breakwater is completed. This particular spectacle came with its own share of danger, however. On May 21st of 1904, a ticket seller was crossing the water tank via a wooden plank when she slipped and fell into the tank, striking her head against the side and losing consciousness. Fortunately for her, another employee was able to leap in and save her before she drowned. Only four days later, during a performance, a valve malfunctioned and blasted two employees with steam, knocking them to the ground and scalding them badly and prompting an evacuation of the hall. In the Dreamland Park itself, the fall of Pompeii was a pyrodrama inspired by, or rather ripped off from, a similar theatrical attraction that had been performed on the island since 1879. Dreamland patrons would sit in a classical Greek temple and watch as a cyclorama of the Roman city of Pompeii was overrun by lava with the help of various pyrotechnics and electrical effects. In 1906, Dreamland really upped the ante with The End of the World, which blended cyclorama with pantomime and even operatic singers to depict, well, it shows the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve being driven from paradise by the angel Gabriel. This is done in pantomime, and is in the shape of a tableau. Beautiful scenery and numerous electrical effects are employed. The audience then leaves the first theater through the subterranean passages, the walls of which are decorated with numerous paintings copied after the style of Doré, and arrives at the second part, the auditorium where the major part of the spectacle is given. This depicts the destruction of the world by fire. The angel Gabriel dividing the wicked from the blessed, showing part of them ascending to the abode of the elect and the rest of them descending to the nether regions. More than 100 people are concerned with the production of the end of the world, and there is a magnificent choir of 25 voices and a wonderful organ. These were all spectacles that droves of people were willing to pony up cash for until suddenly they weren't anymore. Why? That upstart new kid on the block, moving pictures. By the 1920s, cycloramas were a fading memory. The buildings where they had once been proudly displayed were closed down and demolished. The paintings themselves were thrown away or lay moldering in storage sheds. A few managed to survive to the present day, including the aforementioned Battle of Atlanta, but they are at this point a mere historical curiosity. The name, though, Cyclorama, still conjures up images of spectacle, and the curved, wide view even survives in the 146-degree Cinerama technique recently used for Quentin Tarantino's Hateful Eight, although even that is a relic of the gee whiz 1950s and rarely used anymore. The suffix, Arama, has become shorthand for any kind of retro-futuristic attraction. In the 1970s, for instance, there were mold aromas, which had nothing to do with viewing any kind of scene, but where for a handful of change you could induce a cabinet of automated machinery to make a, frankly, not very good toy before your very eyes. And in the most prominent modern example, when Matt Groening wanted a name to convey the wacky retro-futuristic vibe of his new sci-fi cartoon, he called it Futurama. The public desire to witness disaster, safely, hasn't gone away, of course. Some of the earliest films borrowed a page from Cycloramas and portrayed the fall of Pompeii or the San Francisco earthquake. And the 1970s were chock full of disaster movies. And even though I may have turned up my nose at the Cyclorama that depicted the events of the Galveston Flood, premiering only four years after the flood itself, I do have to note that Oliver Stone's film World Trade Center took place five years after 9-11, so my sanctimony is entirely unfounded. Although the cyclorama itself is long gone as a pop cultural phenomenon, there are those of us who still find them fascinating. In 2011, for instance, artists Joanna Ebenstein and Aaron Beebe commemorated the 100th anniversary of the fire that destroyed Dreamland in a particularly fitting way. They designed a cyclorama to portray the disaster using a two-dimensional backdrop, lighting effects, and a disguised viewing platform 
to transport the viewer one century back in time. Robert Barker would have been proud. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Meet Me in Dreamland. If you didn't click like and subscribe when I asked earlier, and shame on you if you didn't, you have another chance to do so right now. Also, if you are into what I am doing here, you can help support my work via my Patreon page. Link is below. And a shout out to my friend Lisa Barrow for helping with some of the research in this episode.